Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's Authors at Google Talk. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Anthony Mayant and Karen Leibowitz here to talk about their new book, Mission Street Food, Ideas and Recipes from an Improbable Restaurant. Uh, they've been doing some of the most interesting and exciting things in the food scene in San Francisco for a while. Uh, they're a husband and wife duo that seem to have no lack of ambition for uh, various restaurant endeavors, some of which seem uh, pretty spontaneous. So anyways, to hear about the genesis of all these ideas, uh, please join me in welcoming Anthony and Karen. Thanks, Chris, and thanks all of you for coming. Um, Anthony's just finishing up some final prep. We're going to give you some food. Um, we actually are here in part because someone came to another event that we did and um, invited us along. And I, I really think this program, Authors at Google, is so wonderful. So thank you so much for having us. Um, I guess we'll just say a little bit about what we've been doing and give you some samples of our book, and then we'll hopefully have a discussion. <clears throat> um, our book is split into roughly two parts, a narrative and a food section with recipes. The narrative describes us a bit and then covers our brief but eventful run in a taco truck in 2008. Um, we sold flatbread sandwiches, which were surprisingly popular, forcing us to move into a restaurant. <clears throat> um, Here's a little excerpt from the narrative of our first night in the restaurant. Can you guys hear? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, so this is a little excerpt from the book, which is uh, from the first night in the restaurant. As soon as we opened, orders started coming in five or six at a time, but the metal ticket holder was broken. We were stacking tickets on the only available surface in the kitchen, which was the narrow counter where we were also plating food. Tickets were sticking to dishes or getting greasy and illegible. When duplicate tickets started showing up, disorganization turned to utter chaos. Finally, we decided to completely disregard tickets and just make random batches of each dish as fast as we could. I can only imagine what the dining room must have been like because I never even left the kitchen. And I should explain that part of our book is structured as a dialogue, so Anthony speaks and then I speak, and we're reproducing that effect for you now. Um, my memories of that night are hazy. As I sprinted the two blocks from the BART station, I was working at the time in Berkeley, um, I saw a crowd standing outside the restaurant and wondered if they'd had to evacuate for some reason. I ran faster. As I opened the door, I saw a completely full house, and it seemed like everyone I knew was there. Half a dozen of our friends had spontaneously stepped in to help. It was unclear who was a server and who was a customer, and even people I didn't know seemed familiar, like in a dream, though I probably recognized some of them from the truck. Then again, a lot of people in the mission look the same to me now that beards have come back into fashion. The new MSF had been open for about an hour, and it was an utter shit show. They had switched over to dim sum style service, and the tables closest to the kitchen were gobbling up all the food, leaving the tables farther away from the kitchen hungry and pissy. And just as a side note, um, we learned after the book went to the printer that one of our friends who was a waitress was actually being grabbed by the legs um, as she came out of the kitchen. Um, people wouldn't let her penetrate farther into the dining room. Um, the beer was warm, the cash register was broken, so a friend was doling, doing all the check calculations with pencil and paper in the dark. As a group, we had no system, no table numbers, no common language for the food we were serving. We were laughably inept. No one wanted to wash dishes full time, so we took turns randomly going back to clean whatever we were desperate for. At the end of the night, I worked that dishwasher for what seemed like hours, wondering how I had arrived at this point in my life. Um, so my other job in Berkeley was as a professor. I could hear Anthony talking with the owners of Lungshan behind me in Cantonese, but I couldn't understand a word. I thought, they'd better be talking about what a good wife I am. <laughs> when we got home, I was exhausted to the point of despondency, but I also felt a little bit sentimental. Anthony had become a chef. I had become a dishwasher slash restaurant manager. Our friends were pulling for us. We were incompetent. We were successful. Nothing made any sense. Um, so I guess maybe it's worth noting that we um, 
we started in a taco truck and we were selling flatbread sandwiches that were kind of designed to make it to take advantage of the facilities the truck had to offer but they were in a sense sort of just like gourmet tacos and um before we had even set foot in the truck for the first time um i guess someone had uh, blogged about it and there was a line of customers waiting uh and then each week um things got more and more kind of crazy and and we were more and more popular and then um eventually we for reasons you can read about in the book um were forced to move into a restaurant uh but we only took two weeks off in that time and we were still working um full-time jobs so we i guess the there were there were a lot of um decisions to be made like what kind of food we were going to serve and who would be the staff and would we even have table service or what would anyone show up <laughs> yeah. um but so i thought you were going to say a little bit about the first menu um <clears throat> so the first menu that we served uh had one of the signature dishes from the truck which was called a PB and J uh it was a uh, crispy pork belly um which is the PB uh marinated jicama and cilantro aioli um among other things um and then also a dish that was a burmese um soup called ono kasue which uh i enjoyed growing up um and then two kinds of fried rice um i guess mainly centered around um smoke smoking the rice and frying the rice in duck fat um and serving it with crispy duck skin uh which in part we're sort of trying to recreate today with um sort of like little peking duck hors d'oeuvres um should we just move on um okay what so that um flatbread sandwich kind of took many forms over the course of mission street food and one of the most successful was kind of a form of peking duck with um a duck breast confit and a duck skin that had been made crispy. Um so we're going to read a little bit about um the peking duck in our book and then also give you a version of that but with chicken. Um so do you want to I've spent I spent a month eating my way around China, but my favorite peking duck is in an old strip mall in the suburbs of Washington DC at Peking Gourmet Inn. The walls are chock-a-block with pictures of politicians and celebrities all smiling the same Peking duck-induced smile. Ducks are carved tableside by lifelong professionals who expertly unfurl broad swaths of crispy skin and slices of tender meat. The restaurant owners serve the duck with a special variety of yellow spring onion grown on their own farm along with hoisin sauce, soy cured peppers, julienne cucumbers, and crucially, thin flower wrappers. The entire ensemble is sublimely satisfying. It's a dish I could eat every day. The traditional preparation of Peking duck involves separating the skin from the fat with a kind of bellows. And actually some friends of ours tried to simulate this with a bike pump before resorting to the air compressor at the gas station one time. The ducks are then air dried for one or two days to remove excess water from the skin, then roasted by hanging over wood embers in a brick oven so the fat can render the and the duck can self baste. Unfortunately, this was not even remotely possible in the small refrigerators and half-broken oven at Mission Street Food. However, it's the crispy skin, hoisin, and cucumber combo that really brings the dish home for me. So it's still possible to approach that Peking duck epiphany without doing anything the right way. We served variations of this flavor combo in tacos, flatbread sandwiches, and even something we called a chinito, a rice noodle wrapped around a Chinese donut stuffed with the usual suspects. So uh, this is what that section looks like in our book and you can see that the recipes are given um photos step by step um and then each one has a little head note so you probably can't read the beginning but it says picking duck is all about the crispy skin our alternative to roasting whole ducks is to start with separate skins and make cracklin Ideally you'd use duck skin but chicken skin is easier to obtain and is a more than acceptable substitution. 
Your local butcher might be nice enough to just give you their unwanted poultry skins, but act quickly. Chicken skin is the new bacon, and soon opportunists will be selling novelties like chicken wrapped in chicken skin. Um, and then the, this is the next page where you get the end of the um, recipe for the um, Peking duck, and then a kind of background on confit. And then you can see on the right, Anthony is enjoying Peking duck with um, an old woman who we work with. Um, she'll eat anything. It's actually kind of our game to bring her any kind of food. I mean, it's not that Peking duck is hard to get anyone to eat, but um, we have brought her those enormous dosas or like food from all nations and she loves it all. So it's very gratifying to watch her eat. Um, but she likes cheeseburgers, I think, the best. <laughs> um, okay. So I guess maybe now we'll just pass out some food and things before we move on. Um, so Mission Street Food was may maybe one of the earlier or first um, pop-up restaurants. And uh, apart from just doing that, we also kind of had some other unusual things going on, um, one of which is that we invited guest chefs from around the city to join us and present half of the menu each time. Um, part of us doing that was because we were um, working full-time jobs and it was really hard to prep enough food for everybody, um, but also part of it was that um, like I was just a line cook and felt a little bit um, I, I don't know, I guess, uh, humble at the fact that I was now kind of chef of a restaurant, not necessarily having like gone through the traditional route or having paid traditional dues. Um, and so I kind of wanted other cooks around the city to have that opportunity to, uh, to come and present like food that they were interested in making. Um, and so we had uh, guest chefs serving um, like all kinds of different food, and then we would just do half the menu also um, in the same style as they did. Uh, so some of the kind of themes that we, or themes or styles of food that we served over the year and a half were uh, Malaysian food, breakfast for dinner, Jewish food, fancy McDonald's, chot, whole hog, and Mexiterranean. So when we first announced this guest chef program, we had kind of big ambitions. We thought it was going to be like a revolution in the American restaurant kitchen. Would, the kitchens tend to be pretty hierarchical, um, and we were planning some kind of collaborative style. Um, and so sometimes we did kind of have that initial dream of a line cook who wanted a chance to try out his or her own food. Um, Sometimes we had more established chefs who were, you know, maybe doing California cuisine every day and they wanted their chance to do something else. Um, sometimes chefs would come to Mission Street Food and do previews of restaurants that they were opening. Um, so, like, we had Wexler's try things out and Baker and Banker um, tried out their food at Mission Street Food. After a certain point, we, we did Mission Street Food for about... 20 months and after a certain point we kind of ran out of people who wanted to work really hard and give away any money that they made to charity <laughs> um, it's weird um, so we were sort of left to our own devices um, and out of that dearth of guest chefs came this idea to do what we called the homage series and it was a way of bringing in a kind of guest chef to give the menu some focus so um, Anthony and his cronies would come up with a chef, often one whose food they had never actually tried, and try to make food in emulation of that style. Um. Um, so my cronies at that time were um, Danny Bowen, who is now the chef of a restaurant um, that came uh, from Mission Street Food, sort of, called Mission Chinese Food. Um, uh, Danny has earned a lot of accolades recently, and I think he's well on his way to becoming a celebrity chef, but at that time he was still just a jaded line cook. Um, and then the uh, 
other person working with me at the time was Ian Munzert, who is now the chef de cuisine at Commonwealth. But he had just worked at um, Qua for a few months, which is like, um, I guess for the past few years has been one of, if not the best, um, like oat cuisine restaurants in the city or in San Francisco. Um, and so basically we had sort of too many cooks in the kitchen uh, and kind of a lot of different ideas and stuff. Um, but so we, I think Danny actually had the idea to just make food in the style of like world-class chefs at Michelin starred restaurants. And, and there was something, you know, sort of ridiculous about doing this in a kind of rundown Chinese restaurant with Christmas lights on the walls and like loud music and people essentially like sharing tables huddled together in chaos in the dark or whatever. Um, but over that time we did menus um, in the style of uh, Noma, which is a restaurant in Copenhagen that has become, or yeah, has since gone on to become the world's number one restaurant uh, and some other um, tributes like to all time great chefs like Escoffier. Um, but so I guess the second thing that we'll be serving today is one of the recipes that um, came from one of the homage, uh, homage dinners, um, which was a Noma tribute. So um, Noma is in Copenhagen and the idea of the restaurant is to do Nordic cuisine, really local ingredients for Scandinavia. Um, some of those ingredients are not available to us. Um, so in our, in our book, we give a, a recipe for the oyster tarragon puree that Rene Redzepi invented. And the head note says, this is my version of a sauce they serve at Noma, the number one restaurant in the world. We add oysters for depth and brininess and to take, off the, take the edge off of the tarragon. It's a complex sauce that could be used with elemental dishes like steak, fish, chicken, or omelets. I apologize to Rene Redzepi and his staff, as I'm sure our version doesn't do justice to Noma's. Serve with a musk ox tartare, wood sorrel, and juniper if you want to bite Noma's style, or go off on your own if you think you're better than Rene Redzepi. At MSF, we couldn't get musk ox, so we used regular ox and ax body spray. Um, so Today, um, we'll be serving the um, oyster tarragon puree with um, a little bit of mushroom and potato, just as an appetizer hors d'oeuvre type thing. So I hope you didn't ruin your appetite with <laughs> chicken confit. One of the biggest advantages of the homage series was giving us something to blog about. Um, <laughs> so actually, we talk a little bit about the importance of our blog in um, these sections called, that we sort of privately called sidebars. So as Anthony mentioned, ha about half of the book is the story of what we did. And then we have these colored pages which have sort of particular things that we discuss. Um, so this one is called Blogstaurant, for better or worse. While the restaurant industry has been pretty slow to adapt to the reality of the internet age, Mission Street Food was an early and enthusiastic adopter of new media. In fact, we could not have survived without the internet. As a pop-up restaurant, we were only visible to the public for about a dozen hours a week, so we used our blog as a substitute storefront window where we could hang our little signs, announcing upcoming events, warning that we would be close for a wedding, or just reminding the world that we existed. We tried to keep it simple. Most of our posts were just a paragraph on the next guest chef or theme, a paragraph on that night's charity. Um, I guess I forgot to mention that we uh, donated all of our profits to um, local hunger-related charities. Um, and finally, the upcoming menu. Can we all agree that we don't need any more flash introductions, ambient electronic music, or close-up food photography before we get to see a restaurant's address? But the internet, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> But the internet is a two-way street. We had our blog and our Twitter account, but we weren't the only ones talking about MSF. We were a hot topic on local sites before we sold our first flatbread. And as time went on, we got more press from serious food bloggers who took meticulous notes on the dishes they ate. Their prioritization of blogging over actually eating was, on the surface, distasteful. 
But upon further consideration, we started to see ourselves as equally responsible, since our menus were practically begging for documentation and commentary. Even worse, we chose our themes with an eye toward our blog. Yes, we were sellouts. In our defense, we behaved no worse than a chef pandering to local food critics. It just so happened that our clientele was largely composed of food critics, democratically selected by themselves. Along with the food we served, we were part of an online feedback loop of blog-driven satisfaction and, quote, critical acclaim. Looking back, our only regret is that we spent so much time trying to make the food taste good, rather than just crafting electronic files replete with polished photos and pithy remarks ready for, quote, consumers to upload to their sites. Or perhaps we shouldn't have involved the customers at all and simply blogged about an imaginary restaurant ourselves. Best of luck to any aspiring blog tours out there. We're looking forward to not even eating your food. Um, so I guess we were thinking that it might be interesting to sort of talk with you guys about the effect of the internet on um, the restaurant business and I guess other kinds of culture as well. Um, we, um, in some ways, our blog led to the book because we spent so much time writing about um, the restaurant that it sort of was natural to, to write further. Um, and I think it does sort of speak to the importance of, um, I guess, how people organize their lives now so that if you can sort of tap into that um, in terms of the menus and, and the marketing and so forth. Um, I think for us, one of the things that was um, pretty surprising was how, like, just how pervasive and, and just how intense kind of press coverage uh, by way of the blogosphere and stuff had gotten. Um, like, one point in particular that, that we mentioned and comes to mind is, um, I think, in the second or third week when we were operating a food truck, a website called Eater. SF, which is like a pretty um, widely read and significant uh, media outlet. Um, in the food industry. Right, in the food industry, sorry. Uh, um, I guess like published an, a piece or an update or something about how we were going to be serving brownies that week instead of cookies. And then like that is pretty ridiculous, but then later they published a crucial update uh, saying that the brownies would be topped with brie, brie cheese and hazelnuts. Um, and this is, of course, in like San Francisco, one of the major food cities in the US. Um, but I mean, so that's sort of a more negative side of thing. But I think on the more positive side, there's the sense that Mission Street Food, um, which was the a project done by people who had no funding and in some ways no right to open a restaurant is like a mirror image of um, the kind of democratization of a lot of culture that you see with the internet where it doesn't cost much to just start publishing um, a blog or something. So um, I guess we were sort of interested in that, that sense of being part of a larger um, breaking down of these uh, barriers to entry for all kinds of business. Um, I mean, in some ways, we're like a startup, I guess. Um, but I guess from there, we're just ready to take questions if you have any. I think so much for coming and bringing food. It's great. Um, I'm a big fan of the restaurant. Um, one thing I always wonder about when I'm there is what the relationship is like uh, between Mission Chinese food and Mission Street food in general, like as kind of a community of people, and um, uh, the Lung Sha the people who work at Lungshan, and um, how that relationship has developed, and if there was sort of any tension with, or like, how do you balance that uh, sort of in the kitchen, I guess? Well, maybe I'll address part. And so, um, Mission Street Food was the um, name that we gave this truck that we parked out on Mission Street. Um, and it seemed like a clever street food thing. And then we moved into a restaurant on Mission Street and kept the name, where it was less uh, accurate, but it was fine. Um, and we, we held on to that and then changed the name to Mission Chinese Food. And it was mostly the same people, but just a different business model. Um, Mission Chinese Food is open every day, whereas Mission Street Food was twice a week. And it has a, a stable menu. Um, so. 
the relationship between those two restaurants is sort of one of evolution. Um, the relationship between Mission Chinese Food or Mission Street Food and Longshan, which is the restaurant that we occupied, is a little more complicated. Um, so I guess we initially started Mission Street Food um, just by going door to door and kind of asking places if they would let us use their dining room or kitchen or let us share the space. Um, <clears throat> and the people at Longshan um, were the only people who were interested. Um, so we started doing that and I, th I think they were pretty, you know, skeptical and curious, but also like pretty, um, I guess, risk neutral or risk seeking maybe even and, and just trying to make a buck. Um, but over time, I, I think that we sort of like developed a mutual respect for one another, like us learning from kind of their kind of thrift and savvy in certain ways and them sort of respecting our like different kind of savvy, if you can call it that. Um, but so but so we operated Mission Street Food the whole time uh, and we were essentially just um, paying them rent, although to make things kind of on the level and from a legal perspective, we had them hire us. Um, but now that it's Mission Chinese Food, uh, like we are all still employees of theirs, um, but we share the profits with them. And it's been pretty, I guess, pretty exciting to, to kind of see how like it's like a real culture clash or like cultural experiment or whatever where like this this business is now very much theirs and like if you know if we didn't have like their infrastructure of like um, kind of kitchen staff and delivery and stuff things would completely fall apart like we definitely couldn't handle it on our own and you know, it's fun to kind of like hang out with them in the off hours when they're like eating watermelon and sitting around goofing around and like kind of grabbing each other's asses and stuff. Um, but so Anthony is functionally the only bilingual person in the group. So mostly people either speak English or Cantonese. Um, so it may be more fun for you, <laughs> but um, I do enjoy seeing him make a joke in Cantonese, and I can tell that he has said something funny, even though I can't understand it at all. Um, but it is really a kind of, um, I guess, mixed bag. Um, but at this point, everyone's incentives are all lined up, so it's, it's good. Go ahead. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to know maybe what was next and what you were thinking about, like what your goal was for the book or how you, how you kind of came about making a book out of this experience, which, I mean, it definitely seems like not necessarily your traditional book, but where do you see, what's sort of next on the horizon? So should I talk about the book and you talk about what's next? Um, yeah, so the book came out of, um, actually a friend of ours who had helped out at Mission Street Food many times um, is, the, uh, is an editor at McSweeney's, and he really let us make any kind of cookbook we wanted. And so it did seem like just an outgrowth of the Mission Street Food Project of kind of purposefully getting in over your head and um, making things up as you go along. Um, so that was, um, that was fun. And I think also the restaurant, because it was so weird, kind of raised questions that we w wanted to address more fully. So some of those essays, like the blog restaurant, are a way of addressing the things like, what is a restaurant anyway? Um, and um, in terms of actual next businesses. Um. Um, well, it, it's also worth noting that there's some kind of silly silliness to start the book in the form of kind of a fake uh, business plan, which is like we never had a business plan because things were, things kind of just grew organically. Um, and then at the end, there's kind of a, an almost like manifesto of how to become a celebrity chef which is, I think, a little bit poking fun also at kind of like celebrity chefhood and stuff. Um, and you know, I, I think we just wanted to write that kind of stuff for fun. Um, as far as what's next, uh, I am really heavily involved at Mission Chinese Food, uh, Karen, to a slightly less extent these days. Um, but then we, I guess, 
uh, will be doing the food program at a bowling alley, which will be opening in the mission soon. Um, it'll be located on 17th Street, be, I guess near between Shotwell and Van Ness. Um, and so we're kind of just getting ready for that. It's, uh, it figures to be technique driven comfort food. Um, and you know, I guess we're hoping to actually make it a little bit technical and not just put like truffle oil and macaroni and cheese and stuff. I was wondering about uh, when you guys designed the menu at Mission Chinese, how you kind of figure out how to balance authentic Chinese dishes versus new technique and like the thrice cooked vegan bacon, how you even think of something like that. So kind of your approach to the design and where you want to draw the line between authenticity and creativity. Yeah, well, I think there's no system. That's the main thing. That's sort of how we always roll. Um, so Danny is the chef at Mission Chinese Food. So uh, at the very beginning, he and I worked like pretty closely on the menu. Um, but he has since taken over and I think the food has gotten a lot better. Um, but we, you know, mostly he just has an idea and we kind of work things out. Um, I, th I think what, um, what the menu speaks towards is uh, definitely a complete disregard of authenticity. Um, like we're happy to kind of evoke certain dishes or resonate certain dishes or flavor combinations that, that people know and like. But um, in a lot of ways, I think that we use uh, kind of like techniques that we've learned in fine dining um, or even from other cultures like Danny ha is an accomplished um, like sushi chef and he's worked in Italian restaurants. Um, I think in as of a couple of years ago, he was the reigning world champion of pesto. Um, so I mean, basically it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a different kind of fusion where instead of just doing like, you know, mango salsa or like different ingredients, um, it's almost sort of like uh, integrating techniques and approaches from, uh, I guess, from other cultures. So like a more coherent fusion, if, if you will. I think I've seen online people debating whether it's like right to use names like Hainam chicken rice for something that doesn't look like Hainam chicken rice in China. Um, and our feeling is basically like it's more like modern art where you can use a name to allude to a tradition and then break away from it. Um, it doesn't have to be um, strict or kind of traditional. And in some ways it's more fun that way, more individual. Um, it seems like you can get authentic food in other places, but you can't get like Danny's intensely personal vision anywhere else. So I guess we're not too concerned about authenticity. Yeah. Um, actually, just really quick on the note of Hainan chicken rice, it was funny because there's a website called Chow Hound and there were like, there was a long thread debating the Hainan chicken rice. and. Uh, I mean, for us, it was hilarious because there were like 80 posts where people were like just really saying harsh things and some people were defending it. And um, I mean, for us, it's like a almost like an afterthought, like it's a it's a cheap dish that's like seven dollars. And, you know, if if Danny wanted to make perfect high numb chicken rice, he he easily could do that. But we just can't given the circumstances and, and different things. So um, I guess going back to the question a lot of like what determines these uh, choices in a kitchen or menus and stuff is just the resources available and like kind of the the capitalist aspects or the physical aspects like the practicalities um, and then we all went to China together this summer and we had Hainam chicken rice and I definitely prefer Danny's and I mean I know that I don't have a lot of um, credibility, um, but on the other hand, if you like eating it, what's so wrong with that, you know? Um, but people can get very worked up about it. Um. That's um, close to what I was going to ask. Um, the restaurant was closed over the holidays because I understand everybody went back to China. Was it, um, did you both go on that trip? And can you talk a little bit about the experience? Um, so we went 
to China where the owners uh, live. It's actually in a small town called Longshan. And the, we went there with the owners and their children and a few of the cooks. And the um, children were the only Americans anyone in that town had ever seen before us. Um, so I think, I think that makes Karen the only Caucasian to ever visit Longshan proper. Um, but it was, a, uh, I think, a great cultural experience for us because they kind of came back in style with um, a lot of, uh, well, I guess it, it's almost like a family reunion when they go back. And so the owner's brothers live nearby. So they all kind of came back from different areas and they had a big banquet kind of in the um, town square and they bought hundreds of dollars of um, extremely dangerous fireworks and kind of launched all these things and it was it was pretty exciting. Yeah, it was it was really um, wonderful for us to see where they came from. This was the um, the man's hometown and his mother was in her 80s and about this tall and held my hand through the whole fireworks situation. We were both a little freaked out. Um, and it was also interesting in terms of food because, you know, a lot of times in California people talk about local and sustainable and so forth, but when we arrived in the town, um, they all went into the garden and, um, you know, grabbed some chickens and picked a lot of vegetables and actually jumped in the pond and fished for that night's dinner. And it was as local as possible. It was about 10 feet away from where we ate. Um, and their whole method of fishing was pretty interesting because two brothers would get in the pond and two brothers were on the side and they had this giant net and they hit the water so that the fish would jump into the net. Um, and it felt like we could have been in any year in the last thousand years. You know, it was so, um, I don't know, it, it was a completely different world from where we were normally cooking together. Um, and then we ate out on this courtyard and everybody sort of cleaned up together and it was, um, it was really amazing. And I think it made some of the tensions that we might feel in the restaurant a little bit muted just to see where they were coming from. Christine? Um, I wanted to talk about the charitable aspect of, of everything that you guys are doing. Um, how difficult is it, is it, first of all, how sustainable is that to make that commitment to charitable giving? And additionally, do you see that sort of model um, progressing? Like, do you see other, other restaurants kind of moving to that? Do you see any sort of trend in that? Um, and where might, where in other cities might we see that sort of thing? Mm. I'll just say a little. So when we first started Mission Street Food, um, we took a small salary for ourselves. I think we each took $400 um, a week. And then everything that we made beyond that, we gave to charities that fed the hungry. Um, these days, Mission Chinese Food has really focused on the food bank because as we got to know more about the food delivery system in the city, we saw that as really the um, most efficient way to make a difference. So 75 cents from every entree at Mission Chinese Food goes to the food bank. And then at our other restaurant, Commonwealth, um, $10 from every tasting menu goes to charity and that rotates every month in a kind of haphazard way. It'll be different issues, not necessarily hunger. Um. Um, well, so I guess uh, charitable restaurants is sort of what got me into the food business to begin with. And I, I had always imagined trying to open a place that was kind of like uh, completely scalable, like Chipotle or something, um, but just with a small charitable aspect. Um, and when Mission Street Food started to become very popular, um, we basically just thought, why not start now? Um, so it was never our intention really to do it that way, uh, but things just kind of progressed that way. Um, and I guess as far as sustainability, um, I mean, so far it feels sustainable. It's hard to say whether the charity actually drives business or whether it like creates a predisposition for, you know, like a, a customer to be like more receptive to it or, um, or not. But, um, you know, so far, I guess since those restaurants have opened, 
like just over a year ago. Uh, in total, I think the two have raised uh, over $100,000 for charity. So that um, I think there's like a lot of room for you know sustainability there. Thank you guys for making the trek down to Google oh, during pleasure. rush hour, nonetheless. Um, can you talk about your inspiration or where did you learn how to cook? Where did this all come from? Um, I, I guess I probably first sort of learned how to cook growing up um, just because both my parents uh, worked and my, I, my grandmother lived with us and she didn't speak English very well, so she watched um, a lot of cooking shows and I, I kind of just watched them with her. Um, and um, I guess since then, my, my first fine dining job was at a restaurant in the Mission called Bar Tartine and they went through a lot of different chefs early on. Um, but then they kind of settled on a really great chef uh, named Jason Fox. And I feel like I learned a lot from various people, but I probably learned the most from him. And then also uh, a lot from um, Danny Bowen, who I work really closely with now. Yeah, I think that um, cooking school is overrated. Um, and so if anyone you know is considering going, tell them not to. Yeah, Chris. Um, thanks for, again for coming. Uh, so on the one hand, you guys embrace a lot of sort of internet things like blogging and Twitter and that sort of thing. Uh, but on the other, you're working with McSweeney's, whose food writing of late has been this um, not so much, I guess, very offline, uh, very long food editorials, lots of photos, and uh, always on paper. Uh, so in a, in a sense, I think it's unfair to call them Luddites, but they're very much kind of more traditionalist when it comes to books. So could you talk a little bit about working with them and the kind of decisions that led to doing the book the way you did it? Sure. Um, you know, I think that McSweeney's, uh, as a publisher, certainly loves paper, <laughs> um, but they're actually doing some interesting things online as well. And originally, we were kind of thinking of doing something more as an app, um, and that could still happen. I think that cookbooks are definitely ripe for that kind of innovation. Um, a lot of what we were doing was trying to break out of the mold of um, traditional cookbooks. So there's a kind of tradition or uh, even cliche of like a little head note that says, I was traveling in Portugal and I met an old woman and she taught me this sauce or something. And then the recipe and then a finished dish photo. Um, and we definitely didn't want to do that. Um, so a lot of our finished dish photos are almost like jokes about finished dish photos, like the pork belly dish is sitting on top of a stack of diet books, <laughs> um, just because we sort of didn't want to do it that way. Um, and McSweeney's definitely encouraged us to do that. Um, I think what they want to do in general is sort of push the boundaries of genres. Um, whatever that is. And so they do really interesting things with paper to show how far you can go with paper. Um, and I think that there's something similar with the cookbooks. Um, they're also, their offices are located kind of um, around the corner from Mission Street Food. So it was also just extremely convenient. Um, to me also, I feel like I've read a lot of cookbooks and the part that's the most interesting um, just for me personally is like learning more about the the people or whatever like the story of the place um, I mean certainly sometimes I really want the recipe or whatever, but uh, These days you can pretty much like find every recipe online anyway Right, so we emphasize the narrative a bit more. Yeah um, What is your favorite restaurant in San Francisco besides your own and your favorite dish at Mission Chinese? Um, well, we have a lot of uh, like budget favorites, um, but I think currently my favorite restaurant that I'm not involved in at all is Atelier Crenn. Um I think that the chef there is really going for it, um, you know, in an extremely elaborate and fanciful way that uh, I think some people 
think is kind of silly or extraneous and I think is uh, like very worthwhile, even though it's somewhat extraneous. But the food is also really delicious. Uh, we went there once. It was um, definitely expensive, um, but very comfortable as an experience. The It's one of those things where the service is so good that it stops being formal and starts being um, relaxed in in a way like everyone's sort of anticipating your needs perfectly. Um, but the food was, um, as Anthony said, a bit fanciful, but kind of delightful. Like you almost felt like you wanted to laugh when you put it in your mouth. Um, so it's a little bit embarrassing to say that, you know, this restaurant that we've only been to once is our favorite restaurant, but that definitely made a big impression. Um, we also, um, we live in the mission and we eat a lot of um, burritos and um, I guess <laughs> we also tend to like going to places where um, we're friends with the chef and so this process of having guest chefs um, was great because you can go and people you know you worked with them and then they are very nice when you come in <laughs> um, I guess also Vietnamese food where? Um, I, I don't know. I like a place in the sunset called PPQ. On Irving near 19th. Um, we also go to the Tenderloin for pho at Turtle Tower a lot. Um, they have a new outlet in Soma. It's kind of exciting. Um, and I, I eat the food at Mission Chinese Food far too often, so I, my favorite's very from day to day? I feel like we're always most excited about whatever is new. Um, like the new thing comes on and I'll eat that um, kind of without cease until the next thing comes. But I think that um, probably the thrice cooked bacon um, might be my standby or the tiger salad. But in normal life, I think we spend a lot of time trying to eat vegetables just to catch up So yeah, I guess we're at time. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thanks.